Hey, what's up everybody and welcome back to That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host Michael and this episode is Q&A number 80. Before we get into today's questions, big thanks to our sponsors, Precision Hydration. Precision Hydration has a great blog full of articles on all sorts of topics related to endurance sports. And one of the recent articles that I found very interesting was the one on immune system. It's uh, titled, Does Exercise Weaken Your Immune System? And it will explain just that. But to give you a brief summary, it's uh, definitely worth reading the entire article, but uh, there are many factors that influence our immune function, including things like sleep disruption, temperature changes, fatigue, altered or inadequate diet, dehydration, psychological stress, and environmental exposures. And if you consider all of these primary variables that influence immune function and pay attention to them, especially during periods of high stress, which most of us are in right now, then that goes a long way to maintaining health and consistency and maintaining an immune function that uh, is uh, as good as it possibly can be for the circumstances that you're in and in the long run they will pay dividends so go and read the entire thing and uh, browse around on their blog plenty of great content there to look at and if you haven't already consider taking their free online sweat test to get an estimate for how much sodium you lose in your sweat if you want to try Precision Hydration's electrolytes, you can get 15% off with the code that Triathlon Show 15 on precisionhydration.com. And thank you to Roka that you can find on roka.com forward slash TTS. Roka has recently released a brand new wetsuit called the Maverick MX, which is a maximum buoyancy wetsuit. So perfect for almost any age group triathlete because most of us are not really good swimmers and uh, then that buoyancy will really help. Roka has managed to marry their arms up technology which gives great shoulder flexibility with a material selection that maximizes buoyancy in the new Maverick MX in a way that uh, hasn't really been possible before due to the fact that adding material to wetsuit really restricts mobility but the arms up technology helps get around that issue so check them out and get 20 percent off your order on any roca products with the promo code uh, that you can find on roca.com forward slash tts today's questions all come from my compatriot pauli in finland who writes hi michael i have some background background in strength sports including powerlifting and bodybuilding but have become increasingly interested in triathlon. Last year, I did a 55-kilometer trail running ultramarathon. I think I know which one you're talking about, Pauli, and I've also done that race. Um, But I also tried a sprint and an Olympic distance triathlon. I have some basic endurance and technique for the individual sports. But uh, now that the full Ironman is coming to Finland, I decided to give that a go. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on if you're aware of any special considerations for the more muscular age group triathletes. I'm not a real bodybuilder sized guy, but I do have a BMI of above 25 at less than 9% body fat and just under 82 kilograms. I've measured a VO2 max of 57 milliliters per kilogram per minute, which is okay for my age, 36 years old, but I'm still very slow compared to serious triathletes. I'm just mainly having fun with the sport and looking to get a decent time under 12 hours on the Ironman. I just found your podcast in January and I've been working my way through 70 plus episodes on my running and cycling workouts. As a side note, I'm also a cardiovascular research scientist with a PhD and I really love the work that you're doing. Please keep up. Please keep it up. Uh, All right, Pauli, thank you very much for your questions. They are super interesting and uh, got me thinking a lot. And uh, the questions, I will read them one by one here because Pauli did write some specific questions, not just generally asking for considerations. The first one here is, with more muscle, are there any special considerations regarding lactate threshold? Bigger muscles obviously require more oxygen, but do they also produce or clear more lactate? Are all standard guidelines about threshold workouts equally valid for athletes of all body compositions? So this question really comes down primarily to your muscle fiber distribution, meaning how large a percentage of your muscles are type 1 or slow twitch fibers and how large a percentage are type 2 or fast twitch fibers. 
And uh, there is uh, some research on this, obviously, and the typical distributions in different types of athletes, including endurance athletes and non-athletes and uh, strength athletes. So uh, I found one paper that I'll link to in the episode description and uh, plenty of other articles that sort of confirm these general guidelines that uh, weight lifters, power lifters tend to have a distribution of uh, almost 60% fast twitch fibers, whereas endurance athletes might have around 40%. So that's a significant difference, obviously, in fast twitch to slow twitch uh, fiber ratios. And uh, just for uh, curiosity, non-athletes also tend to be closer to that uh, strength athlete, athlete ratio of 60%. What this means for triathlon and endurance sports is that since fast twitch fibers are more glycolytic, they will produce or use, the type of athletes that have more fast twitch fibers will produce more lactate, including uh, you probably as a powerlifter background, having a powerlifter background. Of course, we can go a bit deeper with fast twitch fibers. Most of our listeners will have heard of uh, the type 2A and type 2X fibers with type 2A fibers being a little bit of a mix of the really fast twitch type 2X fibers and the slow twitch type 1 uh, because type 2A, they do have a certain oxidative capacity and you can train this capacity, you can train their fatigue resistance. But still, uh, compared to slow twitch fibers, we can consider that a large amount of type 2A fibers still would be contributing to a significantly higher production of lactate in athletes that have a large proportion of fast twitch fibers compared to the typical diesel engine endurance athlete. So if we have a higher lactate production in powerlifter type athletes, it essentially means that you either need to have a really really good lactate clearance capacity and or a really really good lactate tolerance or buffering capacity to compensate for that if you want a high lactate threshold Uh, actually a correction the buffering capacity uh, wouldn't really affect your threshold but more so uh, your tolerance to to muscle acidosis and how how long you can go above threshold so but a high lactate clearance capacity would be essential for you to still achieve a very good threshold if you have if you also have a high lactate production rate and to have that high lactate uh, clearance rate it means that you would ha- need to have high mitochondrial content and uh, and good function of those mitochondria and uh, you would also need to have a well-developed intra- and intercellular lactate shuttling system. And that essentially means enzymes that are involved in transporting lactate uh, across cell membranes and uh, from the cytosol into the mitochondria for the aerobic respiration. So there are some things there, like you don't need to really know this whole biology or exercise physiology background but i know that some people will be interested in this Uh, the point here being that uh, generally all else being equal if we compare you with uh, an endurance type athlete with a more of a, a propensity for a high slow twitch fiber distribution if all else is equal then chances are that you will have a lower threshold than they do because they produce less lactate and all else being equal. That means that all of those aspects that I just mentioned are also equal among the two of you. So, so far, uh, I guess things are pretty straightforward. You are certainly in endurance sports at a disadvantage if you have a higher uh, proportion of fast twitch fibers. But uh, when answering the next part of the question, whether all standard guidelines about threshold are are valid, uh, this is where we will get into some speculation or assumptions. Uh, the first point where standard guidelines and uh, assumption can get us into troubles is when we're assessing your lactate threshold in the first place. And let's now define that uh, for the purposes of this question when we're talking about lactate threshold i will actually be talking about your maximum lactate steady state so the point where your lactate production equals your lactate clearance so first of all the thing that i want to mention is that it's very likely that through the high amount of anaerobically dominant training that you have done through your uh, powerlifting career 
you have probably developed a higher buffering capacity and anaerobic work capacity than a lot of endurance athletes would typically have. So if you go to a lab and they try to sell you on the idea that four millimoles is your lactate threshold, then find another lab. That goes for anybody, not just uh, like specifically muscular athletes or powerlifter type athletes. Uh, it is really perplexing that the practice of equating four millimoles with lactate threshold still exists, but it does. And in fact, relatively recently, I saw a famous pro triathlete uh, with a very big YouTube channel go into a lab and uh, in one of those YouTube videos and to get their threshold assessed. And that, that lab used this particular method saying that four millimoles was their threshold. And that was a bit of a face palm moment, in my opinion. Uh, I do think that most labs, they have evolved beyond that. And it's not common practice, but it does happen. So be sure to check what method they're using to assess threshold if you are going to get your threshold assessed. If you want to assess it with uh, higher accuracy, then I would definitely recommend the inside testing protocol as the primary choice. Uh, but uh, with the more traditional testing methods, do make sure that the, the assessment, as I said, is not based on a fixed concentration like four millimoles, but also make sure that the stage durations are long enough. And by long enough, I would say five minutes is what you're looking for. Now, if you want to do field testing only and not uh, worry about paying for a lab taste, test or an inside test, then you can absolutely do that. But just beware of some assumptions that might not be correct for you, given your uh, body type. If we're talking cycling, for example, then the best field test that you can do, in my opinion, would be to simply do a one-hour time trial. And you could use that as a good estimate for your maximum lactate steady state. If you use a shorter test, like the very typical 20-minute test or even something like a ramp test, this could work, but the conventional correction factors used, for example, taking 95% of your 20-minute power, will probably overestimate your maximum lactate steady state. So your options, if you choose to go with this test, would be to either take a guess and use a correction factor probably in the 91 to 93% range, and uh, for reference, I tend to, with all my athletes, even though many of them are the typical diesel endurance athletes with a high proportion of slow twitch muscle fiber, uh, presumably, I do use 93%. So for you, maybe you might want to go with 91 or 92% as your correction factor, if you're just taking a, a blind guess. But what you could also do, and that, this might be actually my best tip for you, is to do that one hour time trial as mentioned and then a few days later when you're fully recovered do that 20 minute time trial or even a ramp test and create your individual correction factor that matches the 20 minute time trial or the ramp test to the gold standard result uh, so gold, gold standard in air quotes here because it's still an estimate but uh, it's going to be a good estimate uh, so create your own correction factor that matches the uh, the power that you got from the one hour time trial and uh, assume that that's your maximum lactate steady state power and then going forward you don't need to repeat the one hour time trial every time you can simply use that shorter test whether it was the 20 minute test or the ramp test with the individual correction factor that you have uh, you have found to assess your mlss in a less painful way and with uh, less time than that one hour of power and generally speaking, for workouts, uh, and this is still under this assumption that you have a higher anaerobic work capacity and a buffering, higher bu buffering capacity because of the anaerobic background of your sport, uh, some things to consider when doing intervals targeting your aerobic system, which is almost any interval workout you will do as an endurance athlete, you might benefit from doing longer intervals than what uh, a more typical diesel athlete might be doing. Uh, so to give you an example, for VO2 max workouts, a typical uh, diesel athlete, diesel engine athlete, might get a lot of benefit from doing something as short as 30 seconds off, uh, 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off, simply because their anaerobic work capacity is so minuscule that from very early on in, in that workout, they will be relying very, very heavily on their aerobic metabolism. But for an athlete with a high anaerobic work capacity, 
a significant proportion of energy will be derived from that anaerobic glycolysis, which means that you're not giving the aerobic system the stimulus that was intended, which was a maximum stimulus for that system. So rather than doing 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off, so very short intervals with short recoveries, go for significantly longer intervals than that. I would say at a minimum two minutes on, two minutes off, but preferably maybe three minutes on, three minutes off, or even four minutes on and three to four minutes off. This way, even if uh, the early part of the interval will have a significant anaerobic contribution, you will end up emptying that anaerobic battery before the interval is over. So in the latter part of each interval, you're really getting that strong aerobic stimulus that was the purpose of the workout in the first place. And this same concept even holds for workouts at or around threshold. So the aerobic animal might be doing short threshold intervals like 10 times 4 minutes on, 1 minute off. But an anaerobic animal might instead do something significantly longer like 4 times 10 minutes on, 5 minutes off or something to that effect. So that is the answer to the first question. And the next one is, what about nutrition? I'd assume bigger muscles can store, up, can store more glycogen, but does this have any practical relevance? Do you actually have to consume more carbohydrates during a race? Or can you consume less given that if pre-race nutrition, uh, pre-race loading has been successful? So uh, race nutrition, this really comes back to how you produce energy given your fiber type distribution. Again, remember that fast twitch fibers will produce more energy anaerobically than uh, and an athlete with a larger proportion of fast twitch fibers will produce more energy anaerobically than somebody with a higher proportion of slow twitch fiber, regardless of intensity. This is true even at sub-maximal intensities. And when you produce energy anaerobically, you're using carbohydrate only as fuel. Uh, so for that proportion of energy, this doesn't mean that you're ever using 100% carbohydrate, uh, but, uh, but it simply means that for the specific proportion of energy that comes from anaerobic uh, energy production, that energy is fueled by carbohydrate only, whereas the aerobic proportion is fueled by a mixture of fatty acids and carbohydrates. So all else being equal, Somebody like you, a powerlifter type athlete with a higher uh, fast twitch fiber proportion, will be using more carbohydrate as input for your energy production at the same output than somebody with a more of a slow twitch dominant uh, muscle fiber distribution. You are right that uh, the amount of muscle glycogen that you can store is uh, pretty much directly correlated to muscle mass. And uh, I'll give you an example uh, for well trained athletes we can estimate that uh, assuming that you have done a well-executed taper, meaning a significant deload of training, very light training the preceding days, and a good carb loading the preceding days before the race, the amount of muscle gly glycogen that you can store is up to 20 grams per kilogram gram muscle mass. Now, the kicker here is that the glycogen stored in your biceps isn't very useful during the bike or run leg of a triathlon. So to calculate your available glycogen stores for the specific purposes of completing the Ironman, we should use your active muscle mass in the specific disciplines of the triathlon. And for somebody like you, a very lean athlete at uh, 9% body fat, from what I've seen, and this comes from analyzing a lot of inside tests with a lot of pretty advanced uh, physiological data, uh, Athletes with your type of body composition generally have 30% or so of their entire body mass as a good estimate of your active muscle mass in cycling specifically. So, uh, But for somebody, uh, to give another example, if you're somebody with 50 into 20% body fat, then a better estimate might be that 25% of your entire body mass is your active muscle mass for uh, the discipline of cycling. But for you, probably 30%, let's go for that. 30% of 82 kilograms is 24.6 kilograms. Let's multiply that by 20 grams of glycogen per kilogram mus muscle mass. That means 492 grams of glycogen 
is stored in your active muscle mass if you have done the taper and the carb loading well leading up to the race. 492 grams of glycogen, uh, we multiply that by four to get the uh, amount of carbohydrates in calories, and that would be very close to 2,000 calories as stored muscle glycogen. And this is great, again, but uh, referring to, again, analyzing a lot of, of inside tests of different types of athletes, uh, we, I can give you the example of how much carbohydrate combustion in athletes with the exact same threshold at the same power output, for example, roughly 70% of threshold or Ironman race power uh, for many age group athletes, uh, this might be very different depending on if they are an aerobically dominant athlete or an anaerobically dominant athlete. And uh, I actually looked up two athletes that came to mind here uh, that had basically the exact same threshold, looked up the same power output and how much carbohydrate they would be combusting at that power output, which corresponded to uh, pretty much 70% of threshold or realistic Ironman race power. And in the slow twitch dominant athlete, this was roughly 60 grams per hour of carbohydrate, uh, which would be 240 calories per hour. But in the fast twitch dominant athlete, it was close to 90 grams per hour or close to 360 calories per hour. So it's 50% more in the fast twitch dominant athlete, the carbohydrate combustion. And uh, again, uh, remembering that we have stored for you 492 grams of carbohydrate and you might be burning if you're going at this power, which in if I remember correctly, was around 200, yeah, roughly 200, 205 or so uh, watts. That means that you're burning uh, close to 90 grams per hour in in this scenario. This is not exact, but this gives you an example that this is an athlete kind of similar to you. Uh, and if you have the same power out with the same threshold, this could be a, a very close uh, close benchmark. Um, anyway, 90 grams per hour for this athlete. And let's say that they also have that almost 500 grams. They would be out of, of, of carbohydrate or mus- stored muscle glycogen in uh, a little more than five hours if uh, they don't refuel properly so that gives you an idea and the 50 percent more uh, larger carbohydrate combustion compared to the slow twitch dominant athlete or the aerobically dominant athlete gives you an idea that as an athlete with an anaerobic propensity you actually need to probably consume more if anything now for the iron man uh, to be honest, it doesn't make much of a difference because you're not going to be limited by uh, really by how much carbohydrate you combust, but how much carbohydrate you can take in because you're always going to be con- uh, combusting more than you can take in because for most athletes, 90 to maybe 100 grams of carbohydrate per hour is the maximum that we can actually absorb. So so that's going to be your limit. And even for the 60 gram per hour carbohydrate combustion rate something close to 90 grams per hour would definitely be the recommendation because you still you you haven't got only the bike you have the swim and the run to contend with as well so for the ironman it doesn't necessarily make that much of a difference you're still trying to maximize your carbohydrate intake but for something like a half ironman it would make more of a difference perhaps that uh, an aerobically dominant athlete especially if it's a fairly fast athlete uh, definitely might not need to go to the very high end of uh, how much you can take in but they could get away with taking taking in less carbohydrate but an anaerobically dominant athlete like you might still need to be on that high end the 90 to 100 grams of carbohydrate per hour so uh, so that is the things that i would consider when it comes to nutrition and uh, the next question here and by the way, so just uh, one more thing that I want to mention on that is that uh, those particular athletes had a maximum lactate steady state of 280 watts for the example that I took there with uh, how much carbohydrate they uh, they combust at 205 or so watts, which would be 70% or so of threshold. Now, the next question that Pauli asks is, does muscle mass have any particular relation to hydration? I've diagnosed myself as a salty sweater based on the white stains on my, on, my, on my clothes when I train. I also sweat a lot, which might be genetic, but I might also be producing quite a bit of heat during endurance activity. So, uh, yes, I think uh, definitely, in a way, muscle mass have a direct relation to hydration. Uh, 
and in particular on the run. Uh, but it's not necessarily muscle mass. It's as much probably just mass in general. So you at 82 kilograms will have to produce a lot more energy than me at 67 kilograms if we're both running at the same speed to go that speed. And this also means that there's a lot more heat produced uh, in your body and the body needs to dissipate that heat. And if your body is well adapted to this demand, uh, that means that it's well trained to produce sweat. So sweat increases in sweat rate is one of the adaptations that we actually get as we get fitter. Then if your body has this adaptation, it has adapted to this and is producing adequate sweat for dissipating heat, then uh, you will be all else being equal again sweating more than a smaller athlete potentially now as you mentioned there are a lot of other components to how much you sweat uh, but uh, definitely uh, a greater body mass might have an impact that causes you to sweat more that being said uh, that is a very general uh, sort of statement and the more important thing for you to consider is your individual sweat rate and individual sodium concentration and You've already self-identified as a heavy sweater and a salty sweater. So you have already actually taken some very significant steps there. Try to get even more specific about it, like measuring your fluid losses in various conditions in training. Uh, so how much do you sweat per hour in liters uh, to get an idea of what that will be on race day. Uh, of course, this will be different when you bike indoors compared to outdoors uh, in different temperatures. And if you run, what is it going to be then? So Again, try to cover different scenarios. And for your sweat sodium content, if you have white stains on your clothes, then it is a good indication that you might be a salty, salty sweater. Uh, there are some other things as well to consider. So I would strongly recommend taking Precision Hydration's sweat test on their website to get an estimate and use that together with your sweat rate number that you come up with from your testing to formulate a hydration plan for your race. The next question is, uh, do you have any special points for swimming? I find that I might be able to produce quite decent power in my stroke and in my kick. But on the other hand, since I am more dense, I also feel like I'm less buoyant. Can this be compensated by some technical cues? So those observations are quite typical for athletes with your body type. So no surprise there. And uh, the same general points in terms of training uh, that I already mentioned still apply before I go into the technical cues. So your threshold should either be estimated conservatively if based on a single time trial, like a thousand meter time trial. You could also use an alternative test like the critical swim speed test, uh, which uh, is a 400 plus 200 meter time trial. That test aims to account for the aerobic versus anaerobic strengths and weaknesses profile of the athlete by using the differences in speed between the longer and shorter time trials to find your critical swim speed. But I would still say that a CSS is probably a bit faster than your maximum lactate steady state, so keep that in mind. That even if you, you do use that test and you do a good test and uh, you see that your CSS is significantly slower than your 400 meter uh, time trial because probably you were able to go quite a bit faster in your 200 meter than your 400 meter time trial, in terms of your pace, I mean. So you had a drop-off, and that drop-off to CSS is uh, quite large. That shows that, okay, things seem to be working well with, with that test. It seems to give you a good idea of what type of athlete you are, anaerobically strong. But even so, you might actually be above MLSS, maximum lactate steady state, at that CSS. Uh, and I would say that even for diesel-type athletes, this can often be the case, that CSS is... It's not exactly the same as maximum lactate steady state, so uh, so I would rather uh, rather be conservative if we're actually using maximum lactate steady state as a way to anchor training, which can be useful. It's not the be all end all, but it can be useful to have an estimate of that when you're doing some specific workouts, like those workouts that are intended to improve things like lactate clearance, for example, then it can be pretty important to have an idea of what your roughly your maximum lactate steady state is. And that is probably not your CSS. The other thing that I mentioned earlier in terms of general training advice is that uh, about the early parts of intervals being anaerobically driven for you more so than for uh, aerobically strong athletes and that means that you might be better off swimming longer intervals 
to get the intended aerobic benefit of those intervals. So if you're doing a VO2 max workout, when your buddy, uh, Donny Diesel, swims 100 meter repeats, you might be better off swimming 150 meter repeats, even if that means that you have to hold back a little bit with your pacing. As for technical cues to keep a good body position and not have your legs sink due to the, your body density, this applies to anybody who struggles a bit with body position in the water, not just muscularly dense athletes. But uh, the cues that come to mind for me would be, first of all, to keep your head down and look down towards the bottom of the pool. Second, to make sure that you exhale into the water uh, every time that you or all the time that you have your face in the water so that you don't build up buoyancy in your chest and in your lungs specifically. And third, to make yourself tall in the water and keep yourself tall in the water so that your center of mass is closer to your chest than to your legs. And the way to do this is by making sure that when you start to pull your leading arm back, there's only a very short gap in time until the recovering arm takes the place as the new lead arm extended in front of you. You don't have a big gap where your head is the leading edge of your body. It's always one of the, the hands that is the leading edge, or, or almost always. There is a small delay from one arm starting to pull to the next one entering the water and extending. But the point being that it should be a very short break and you should not have your head be the leading edge for anything more than a fraction of a second. And finally, the final cue is that do anything that you can to reduce drag, because when you reduce drag, you increase speed. And with increased speed, it becomes easier to keep the legs at the surface, which of course helps you keep up that speed even better. So that's uh, a positive feedback loop. Easier said than done, of course, but uh, worth keeping in mind. Uh, the next question and the final question is, uh, would I have any particular strengths or weaknesses on the bike? Again, I feel like I'm able to produce quite good power, but on the other hand, my legs might require a lot of oxygen, so my heart rate tends to go up easily. I might be strong on flat stretches of the bike course, but perhaps struggling on uphills. Any way to prep for this in training? So to recap, because a lot of the strengths and weaknesses are general, and we've already mentioned them, uh, again, those uh, general things would be all else being equal, you will have a lower maximum lactate steady state than a slow twitch dominant or aerobically dominant athlete. You will have a higher combustion of carbohydrate for the same relative intensity or absolute intensity if we have the same threshold. You will have a good capacity, as you mentioned, to produce a large amount of power over shorter durations, so a good punch. And this could actually be a really great asset in things like draft legal triathlon races, sprint and Olympic races when you're uh, in a bunch or in crit racing on the bike. And you probably have uh, a propensity to good absolute power numbers, even though lighter athletes might have a better propensity to high power to weight ratios. Uh, so general training recommendations that I would give to uh, to keep in mind on the bike and on the run as well and swim would be a strength endurance training uh, to improve the oxidative capacity and the fatigue resistance of your type 2a fast twitch fibers and strength endurance simply means uh, high torque training so uh, for example big gear work on the bike so put your bike in a big gear high resistance and pedal at a low cadence so power might not be super high it can be like a tempo-like effort, so uh, 80% of, of FTP, for example. And you might be doing repeats of, uh, for example, this is just an example workout, uh, four by 15 minutes at that 80% of FTP, but your cadence should be, let's say, 60 RPM or so. And uh, then you recover for five to 10 minutes and then you do it all again. So that's an example of a strength endurance workout. On the run, it might be simply to uh, go and run a very hilly trail, and uh, try to accumulate as much elevation gain as possible you don't need to run the hills super hard just a sort of a steady steady effort and another swim paddles uh, that's uh, a place where you might want to be careful if your technique is not up to using paddles but uh, definitely worth using them uh, so just try to make sure that you use them with correct technique and uh, the same sort of thing applies that when it comes to strength endurance you don't have to go super hard more so a, a tempo kind of effort is 
is a good intensity range to keep yourself in. So moderate intensity and uh, quite a large total duration of work and try to progress that total duration of work over time. That is how you can uh, improve that capacity, that oxidative capacity and fatigue resistance of your type 2A fibers. The second type of workout that I would recommend for athletes with uh, your, uh, with what you probably have, which is a higher fast twitch fiber proportion and uh, you being strong, stronger anaerobically, would be lactate shuttling workouts. And this is specifically to improve your lactate clearance because as we uh, established or at least assumed, you will be producing more lactate than a lot of athletes you want to be very effective at clearing that lactate and that will increase your threshold or MLSS. And uh, lactate shuttling uh, workouts, the principle is simply to uh, produce enough lactate so that your uh, so that your body has to work to clear that lactate, but uh, spend a reasonably long duration uh, at, uh, at that state of high lactate in your body to, to give your body the stimulus to to actually clear it for a long time and, uh, and and then adapt to it and produce more enzymes that help with that lactate shuttling inter and intracellularly. So uh, a great example of lactate shuttling training is over-unders. So you might be going for two minutes on, two minutes off, and the two minutes on would be a little bit above threshold. And then you go two minutes off, which would be not complete recovery, but it wouldn't be hard either. It would be kind of like zone two uh, steady zone two high zone two and uh, because that's generally where you actually you clear lactate most effectively so uh, a common mistake that i see with with over unders is that a lot of people do the under parts very very hard so you might go 110 percent and 90 percent of ftp and uh, that 90 percent is just too hard especially if ftp is overestimated uh, then 90% of FTP might be very close to your MLSS, which means that you're actually not getting that stimulus for clearing lactate. So the unders definitely should be significantly easier, but they should not be just lollygagging. Uh, so that's sort of your cue for getting the intensity right. Uh, and um, an example workout might be something like uh, three times 12 minutes as uh, two minutes on, two minutes off, sort of. And recoveries can be pretty plentiful between those 12 minute bouts and uh, with regard to flat courses and hilly courses as you say on flat courses you potentially have a strong point uh, because uh, power to aerodynamics is more important than power to weight when the course is flat or relatively flat and the good thing for you is that that is the case for most triathlon courses they simply are not hilly enough for power to weight to be uh, very important or at least not as important as power to aerodynamics so so on the bike for for you being a muscular guy that can actually be an advantage generally speaking in in the triathlon as long as you can get yourself aerodynamic enough to bring that power to aerodynamics ratio up but again as you say if you do end up racing something very hilly then yes you will be at a disadvantage compared to lighter athletes uh, for sure due to your power to weight ratio not being as good I do not think that there are any ways to specifically prepare for these aspects. You have the body that you have for the foreseeable future, at least. Of course, if you lose some upper body mass, which you probably will if you start focusing more and more on triathlon or endurance sports or uh, strength training, then that will help your power to weight, ra weight ratio. I don't know if that's something that you want uh, or had to happen or if it's something that you want to prevent happening. But that is one thing that might happen long to medium term that can help you improve your power to weight ratio. But then other than that, just generally increasing your power output across the board will, of course, always help. But there's nothing very specific, I would suggest, uh, in terms of uh, training for flat or hilly courses. Improving your power is always going to help regardless of the course. So that's it. Thank you, Pauli, for your great questions. Uh, it was uh, a real uh, pleasure to answer them. I really enjoyed uh, enjoying thinking about them and uh, hope that my answers helped you. If you have questions that you want answered on a future Q&A episode, please send them to me on michael at scientifictriathlon.com and that's Michael with a K. Please subscribe to the podcast. On Monday, we have the next episode coming up as usual and that is an interview 
with Bradford Cooper on the topic of functional mental toughness, a discussion that I found really, really interesting. If you are a long-time listener and you enjoy what you hear on this podcast, please consider leaving a rating and review. And the best place to do that is uh, Apple Podcasts or iTunes, because that's where actually the ratings and reviews seem to help in bringing the podcast up in the, up in the rankings so that more people find it so that we can keep uh, the sponsors happy and uh, everything like that and keep the podcast going, being sustainable for the long term. So uh, I hope that you can take a couple of minutes to do that, leave a rating and a review. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks to our fantastic sponsors, Precision Hydration, that you can find on precisionhydration.com. Go and get a free hydration plan on their website, and uh, that will give you an idea of how much you sweat and how much sodium you lose in your sweat. And you can then, if you want to, order some electrolytes that you can tailor to this plan. With the promo code DATREFLONSHOW15, you'll get 15% off your order. And thank you to Roka that you can find on roka.com forward slash TTS. That page will give you a 20% discount code on your entire order of wetsuits, dry suits, swim skins, goggles, and high-performance eyewear. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlon.